Welcome. Welcome everyone to the Trust the Plan podcast. My name is Nick Hopwood. Jim is not with us today, a little different format. I'll be speaking with my friend Larry McDonald, who runs the Bear Traps Report and is an author working on a new book. But uh, today we're talking about his original book. It's called A Colossal Failure of Common Sense. It's the inside story of Larry's days working at Lehman Brothers before the collapse. It's basically a memoir. Very interesting. Uh, I'm not aware of any other inside anecdotes in any uh, books like that. You know, there's plenty of books out there like The Big Short, which were made into movies as well, which Larry talks about. But, uh, you know, that's just kind of like um, a broad brush um, from the outsider's perspective. But this, this is very inside. Larry's experience growing up, uh, working at different firms, and then being a trader at Lehman, everything from the inside, some great stories in that book. I strongly recommend it. Be sure to listen in to the end where you can find out how to get your own free copy of the book. And um, I guess that's it. Without further ado, let's welcome in Larry. Welcome. Welcome to the Trust the Plan podcast. I'm Nick, joined with special guest Larry McDonald. Larry, it's so great to have you here today. Hi, Nick. It's, it's been a while. It, it's good to catch up. Thank you. Yeah, Larry worked at Lehman Brothers and wrote a, uh, I guess you'd call it, you know, what, what, do you, what category is your book in? A Colossal Failure of Common Sense. Well, it, I'm proud of the fact that it was just named by the CFA Institute as in the top 20 uh, financial books of all time. Fantastic. And I'm really excited about that. And then when Charlie Munger invited me out to Omaha uh, you know, years back and, and uh, I had a private meeting with him and he said, Larry, I love, I love the book. So it's a, it's a colossal failure of common sense, the inside story of the collapse of Lehman Brothers. But it's a great book for kids because you can go back in time and really live through uh, day by day uh, an important part of financial history. Yeah, I would say that it's it's probably one of the only inside accounts of the story of Lehman Brothers through through uh, there's the nine thirty bell in my ear through the uh, the collapse two thousand wait you were there two thousand four through two thousand seven two thousand eight right yeah yeah so, it was um, you know it was kind of like I was there and in the summer of two thousand eight we could see. There was a group of revolutionaries within the bank that really could see the leverage that, like you, I think you mentioned, in forty-four times leverage, and that, you know, that that leverage was so s severe relative to, uh, you know, the assets on the books, which were pretty illiquid. And so this is kind of a great backstory. So it was the summer of two thousand eight, and I had this friend on Cape Cod, Patrick Robinson, who. He'd written Lone Survivor, which was a number one New York Times bestseller. Great uh, book. A movie. Yeah, great book. Great book. With, with Marcus Luttrell, the famous mm -hmm. Navy SEAL. And it became a movie with Mark Wahlberg. And it was about these, these Navy SEALs in Afghanistan. And so this was a close family friend. His, son, his, friend, his son, James, is a good friend of mine. And um, so James invited me up to the Cape to have dinner with the family. And it was 4th of July. And I told the guys at Lehman kind of this group of revolutionaries that were trying to stop the madness. And they said, hey, if you, if you ever land a deal with, with Patrick, uh, we love this last book, and we'll, you know, we'll help you on Colossal. Because I was, I was a trader. I ran one of our distressed high yield businesses, but I wasn't in the inner circle. But uh, because of my age at that time, I was a little older than most people on the street. And I had a lot of close relationships with some, some of those revolutionaries that were in the inner circle. And so I went up to the Cape and I start Saturday night, I start you know, we had dinner and I'm pitching Patrick on this, what might happen. And these two ladies at the corner of the table start laughing and laughing and laughing. And finally, I looked over and I said, what's so funny? And they said, <laughs> well, it's a Saturday night on Cape Cod. And here's another ass, ass from New York uh, pitching Patrick on another book deal. Because <laughs> his <laughs> lone survivor was so big that he was, he was a rock star. He was like the Tom Clancy of the United States. And everybody's pitching him. And he leaned back in his chair and he said, Larry. Don't be silly, liar. I'm working on Shimon Perez's memoirs. He said, I won't be done until 2010. And this is July 2008. And I looked at everybody at the table. There was one guy that I looked over was in tears. And I looked, I looked at everybody and I said, if this bank goes down, 
If she goes down, it'll be bigger than Enron, WorldCom, Adelphia, and General Motors combined. And it's gonna change all of your lives forever. And uh, the table got very quiet. And uh, mm. Patrick, he had a Chivas Regal in her office and put it down. He said, <laughs> Lawrence, he said, by the stroke of midnight, December 31st, 2008, I'll shake right here. You have a deal she, if, if the bank goes down. But so he gave me like six months. And sure enough, she went down in September and uh, it was just like the Titanic. And it became a New York Times bestseller instantly. And, uh, and I, owe it, I owe it a lot to the Robinson family. So special, special thanks to them. Great story. And I didn't realize Patrick was the author of Lone Survivor. Uh, I remember reading that book and just thinking, you know, I mean, just total sense of patriotism. And I was like, I just want to send money to Marcus Luttrell through just what can I, what else can I do? You know, I just wanted to, to do anything I could because he had to suffer and his comrades suffered through all that. Just terrible. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, so great book. And it starts with, you know, your, your childhood, you know, visiting Notre Dame with your dad and playing golf and selling, selling pork, right. To, to, <laughs> work on your, your sales skills and then landing at Merrill Lynch. And so that was interesting to me because, you know, as an RIA, right. Uh, you know, starting out in the broker dealer world as well, um, uh, more independent rather than wirehouse. But I, I found myself wanting to ask you, it seems like you had a lot of success in your first year or two at Merrill Lynch, but you had this dream of being on the trade floor. And so you gave that up. Well, yeah, you know, early on, you know, like Steve Jobs was kind of like a hero to me. And, you know, one, thing, one of the things he always talked about is if you just practice selling, like as you're a young person, if you're watching this, if you become a good salesperson at anything, um, like Steve Jobs would really try to master sales and practice selling during any way you can. And um, so I got into the, the, my wealth management business, but um, I always wanted to, you know, I, I was a little concerned because we, we ended up, I was concerned that the financial advisory business might be affected by technology. And I had a good friend of mine, uh, Steve Seafeld, who was in uh, New York and he was developing a platform for uh, an internet website that would take all of the convertible bonds in the universe uh, in the US de debt, debt, debt ecosystem and put them on the internet and and it was called convert point. So we, I went, went down there and I left the business and I, I, I really wanted to become a dot, dot com entrepreneur. And I figured if it was ever successful, maybe that would lead to the institutional side of the business, which that's my goal. And um, I joined there in like 2006, I'm sorry, 96, 97. And uh, we ended up selling the website to Morgan Stanley in October of 99. So I was very fortunate because that was right near the, the top and uh but at the end of the day i would we would have been better off creating a dating website or something like that we made some <laughs> money but but it was, a, it was a great learning experience yeah i uh convertbond.com is also your twitter handle right so yes kind of like uh you know you know reference to that old website back in the day and didn't morgan stanley purchase that and then immediately shut it down it's almost like they wanted to keep the competition at bay yeah, they, they, they were really intimidated by, because um, back then we thought, this is, how, this is how crazy life is and big cycle thing. We thought when they bought us and we thought running the company that online bond trading would explode. In other words, the way, the way online stock trading took the commissions from when I, was, when I was younger, I mean, these stocks like Intel would trade at a 75 base, I'm 75 cents spread. So if the stock was 66 bid, the offer would be 66 and three quarters. It was just an enormous spread. And the E-trades and the technology of that era um, really compressed that. And I, we thought that would happen with bonds really fast. And it has happened to some extent, but it's, it was much slower than we anticipated. And so now there is a, a collapsing spread there in, in bonds, but it, it took, it's taken a lot longer than, much longer than we ever expected. And then you moved on to eventually Lehman. And I think your, uh, your longtime friend, Larry McCarthy was instrumental with that, if I'm not mistaken, and you worked side by side with him and you mentioned other people like uh, Christine quite a lot. 
And then there's the Michigan guy, right? Uh, Mike G from Michigan, Michigan Ross, which is where we are in Michigan. And that's where I went, the University of Michigan as well. So, um, you know, how was the transition going into Lehman back in the day, 2004? Well, I was just so blessed because like I got to work with Christine Daly, who was, I mean, the best distressed analyst on Wall Street. And she's just Hall of Famer, first ballot. And she took me under her wing and just taught me everything about like capital structure arbitrage. Because, uh, you know, when you're a young, when you're a young person coming into business, you think stocks are everything. And each year you open your eyes to my God, there's so the stock market's just a tiny little sliver of nothing, you know, and there's, there's so much, there's so many other asset classes that have a huge impact on stocks and, you know, company, companies have much more leverage than you can see. Most investors can't see the leverage. And so you look at a company and you just, I just didn't really understand that when I was younger Then I, she really opened my eyes to really looking at a whole company's capital structure and say, okay, you know, how much debt, how much equity, how much secured debt, how much preferreds. And then that helps you really understand, um, you know, the risk and, and, the, and, the, reward, and the reward. And then uh, Jane Castle was, uh, was our, another, another analyst and she was the, probably the best airline credit analyst on the street. So I had just two incredibly talented women. And then Mike Gelban was just like, Mike, you know, what's amazing about Lehman and the whole thing, Lehman crash, but the cream always rises to the top, right? So Mike Gelban is now, he started at Exodus Point, which was a, I think a six, I think an $8 billion hedge fund launch, the largest of all time. And uh, that's, that's how successful the second half of his career has been. And now I think they have 20 billion. So wow. Mike, Mike, Mike was my mentor and I owe, I owe a lot to Mike uh, working with him was just like working with those three people was like, and Larry McCarthy and Alex Kirk and whole, whole group. And it seems like to me as the, you know, as the uh, lay person um, without the trade floor experience and just reading the book, that one of the themes that you really wanted to drive home was Richard Fold, right? Dick would enter in the back and go straight to the 31st floor and bypass everyone else, never talk to any of the traders or department heads, rarely. And you have Jane and Christine and Mike and Larry and you and whoever else looking at things saying, what's going on? And, you know, if he would have listened to and had open lines of communication and maybe considered his ego, among other things, things could have turned out a lot differently. Yeah, I mean, I got a call. Um, Inside Job is a documentary that won the Academy Award. And I got a call to be in the movie with Matt Damon. So I, I make an appearance in there. And all they wanted to talk about, really, the main focus was this secret elevator that Fold had, which is like, uh, it was programmed so that he would come down the west, uh, the east side in his uh, BMW uh, with his driver, and then they would pull into Lehman, and then there was like 15 feet between the door, maybe 20 feet, and he could just jump in the elevator, it was a private elevator, took him up to Club 31, and it was like, we never saw him on the trading floor. And that was one really important thing. The other thing I realized, and over the years we've created the bear trap support to try to mm -hmm. democratize information. It's our research platform. But I realized that I always suspected when I was a financial advisor that some of this um, research gets picked over by the institutions and then goes out to the retail audience. And uh, sure enough, yeah, I saw it firsthand that they would take some of the research the institutional investors would, would would really pick over the best ideas and then they would repackage it and give it to uh, the advisors. And that's why I have so much respect for someone like you, Nick, because you're one of these guys that like, you're bird dog, you're, you know that, you get the joke, you got the joke a long time ago and you're out there uh, with the best consultants and you take your own money, you've invested and they're really beating that game. And that's what a good advisor does. Well, thank you for that. Um, I, I do remember one of the things that you, and I've been a subscriber of Bear Traps for probably over 10 years. And so if we go back to COVID, uh, March of 20, you know, quite a shock to, the, to everyone's system as far as money goes and just our lifestyle. But one of the things, you were the first person who I remember said, this is a recession. 
and it was like March 15th, you know, and I'm like, oh, he's probably right. And no one else was talking about that at all, right? There, uh, people had other things on their mind. So I'd like to, you know, give you credit for, you know, making calls like that. Another of one of your famous calls, I love this, was in, in, the, in the December, Christmas Eve of, of uh, 18. So Powell was raising rates and he raised just a little too much, right? And so- uh, That was a tough Christmas down, for everybody. <laughs> yeah, the market went down 19.9%. Uh, peak to trough. And I remember sending out after, you know, um, probably uh, same time when you were saying, this is the, the turns coming, right? I remember sending out an email to all the clients saying no Santa Claus rally this year, but that was the low. So you have a good track record. I would say great track record in different asset classes of understanding the turning point and that's one of the things that you do in, in your daily and weekly report is talking about the turning point and you use that term a lot in the book as well, the turn, be ready for the turn. And so uh, I just want to give you credit for, for your analysis. And I think, honestly, your business model that you have now is pretty ingenious with having your institutional chat because, you know, you put this together and you're getting input from... It's kind of like being on the trading floor in the old days, right? Where you That's have all these great, <laughs> these really talented people with great insights, with maybe some different perspectives, maybe different expertise, and you can put it all together and cherry pick that data and that info. Yeah, that's what I, I really, it brings me back to the Lehman bite because behind me, yeah, we've got about 650 institutional investors in maybe 22 or 23 countries. And they're, what happened? And the reason I can pull this off is I did about 140 speeches on the book. In, I did 140 speeches in 16 countries. So I met, you know, there's no I in team. So I met some incredible people around the world. And uh, a lot of them are in the chat. And they've kind of some of my mentors. And, and what's great is some of them are really strong in rates. So interest rate derivatives. Or some are really strong in commercial real estate. Some are really strong in oil, gas, natural gas. And some are really strong in, in, um, in high yield and distress. And so that, you know, you talk about 2020 in that first quarter. What we noticed and the reason we were able to get in front of that turn was that if you looked at rates and oil and copper, the move that they made, and so the equity market didn't top until about the 20th of February. And he, like, and then it, then it, slow, it didn't quick, it didn't really pick up steam until around St. Patrick's Day on the way down. But before that, there was like three weeks where copper, uh, high yield. So I, when all four of those are saying something, that's when my, my sniffer goes up. So you had rates. So now all that means for the person watching us is that the 10 year treasury rallied in terms of yield going down. like. I want to guess, I want to say 30 basis points in a very short period of time. Uh, then you had copper down 15, 20% in like a week. Oil, same thing. High yield, high yield spreads blowing up. When those four are moving together in a very short period of time, it's telling you that equities are, the risk reward in being equities is extremely poor. Now, that doesn't happen a lot. So you can most they're not what's what's the famous stat you know that like I think you, you told me this stat years ago 65 75 seventy five percent of the time stocks go up so you got to be really careful picking your trying to catch any of these downturns because seventy percent of the time stocks go up but there are times when the risk of war is really poor on, on the on the long side. Very good. Um, and so when you're looking at these data points like you're talking about copper and spreads and high yield and everything. One of the things that you've kind of coined, which, you know, it makes me chuckle, you call it the, the, the Lehman 21 indicators, right? So you're looking at these data points, thinking about maybe what, what went wrong at Lehman or what people should have been paying attention to. So can you talk about that for a second? Yeah, those are some, so the Lehman 21 systemic risk indicators look at, there's always an epicenter of risk in the world. So in 2008, it was the US banks. Uh, in 2012, 13, it was really in the uh, European banks because their exposure to the Greek crisis. And then 
in recent years, it's been in Asia because of COVID and, and the epicenter in China. So what happens is if you look at credit risk in some of these epicenters, when like, for example, one of the reasons why we kind of got bullish on China toward the year end was China credit was improving, China FX. So uh, the, the yuan was improving dramatically. And those were kind of leading indicators on the bullish side for, for China and emerging markets, uh, because emerging markets are very sensitive to China's, um, it's very complicated, but very sensitive to China's um, currency situation. And so the, the indicators look both bullish and bearish, and they kind of give you signals as to when you maybe should get long some parts of the world and when you should get sh short. Uh, right now they're screaming, you know, bullish things for Brazil and uh, Brazil banks have been through a Dilma Rousseff impeachment. They've been through COVID. It'd be a horrible recession. They've been through then a China lockdown on top of the COVID and then a, an election with this Lula risk. And when you have one of these elections, it's always like with AMLO in Mexico, uh, president left us. The stocks went down 30, 40% into that because you know, the media sells the agenda of the, of the, the left center market unfriendly candidate really aggressively. And, they, and so this dark picture uh, kind of forms, but if you look at the indicators under the surface, um, the legislature is actually in a blocking position and therefore the agenda is not as market unfriendly as you might think. And therefore that can be really bullish. And that's what I suspect is going on in Brazil now. So these indicators look at credit risk, they look at equity ball, they look at political scene, they look at um, where risk is moving in the world. One great indicator is we saw this in November, like tertiary currencies. When they really start moving like Mexican peso, Chilean peso, when they really start moving either, what they, they're both indicators either way. When they start improving very sharply in a short period of time, it's a very bullish indicator for global equities. Uh, when they start moving uh, in the night, like when the dollar is strengthening and, and these emerging market currencies are typically the tertiary currencies are, 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 suffer, you know, some much more pain initially if there's some, you know, event with happening with the dollar that can really disrupt the globe. Like last year, last year was like the, was in the top th three years of the last hundred for the dollar to be in like this safe haven status, right? Because of the war, because China lockdowns, Europe was a mess. And, so yeah, so the indicators are great at kind of picking up on some of those things, but it's, it's a lot of work. And, you know, we have a, a team of probably 30 people that go through these things. And I just owe a lot to, to, the, to the team. Terrific. Now, one of the things that you mentioned in the book, uh, I like to refer back to some of these stories, right? So you talk about Fold uh, and his golf cart smashing the governor. And, you know, you could just picture him cruising at 140 miles an hour across the ninth green, just buying every hedge fund, every jam of a property in the peak of the bubble, right? And just going 140 miles an hour, you know, straight to death's door. Is there anything like that happening right now that, that keeps you up at night where you're looking at one thing or the other, maybe the debt ceiling, a parallel to 2011, you know, maybe what we're seeing right now uh, is similar to, to the tech bubble of 2000, where, you know, it's, it's more like a three-year story instead of just a 22-year story. So, you know, anything like that on the horizon today? Well, our next book is coming out and addresses this, like, massive trend shift that's going on because we're at a historic point. And, um, and I think, you know, we, we may not go anywhere for the next, like, three to five years on the indices. Uh, but there's going to be tremendous opportunity within within the S&P 500 or within certain parts of the market. And so in a, in a certain deflationary regime where you have certain deflation, growth stocks do great because the Fed's always there. We had a winter in 2014, a cold winter in New York that literally they called it the polar vortex came down. And it, the oh, Fed, I remember that. The Fed pivoted with a, you know, another dose of QE. It was unbelievable, like cold winter got the Fed to, to, to basically try to pump the 
from the spigot. Um, but when you go into a, an, an inflationary regime, it's, it's very difficult to get rid of inflation without at least eight to 10% unemployment. It's extreme. It gets under the seat cushions. It gets behind the walls. And there's a group of people in the United States now, financial markets that are talking up this soft landing and, and that's going to, you know, earnings are going to be okay. Right. And, and that's fine. They can have that view, but that view, which is mind blowing. This is like Pavlov's dog, you know, where you, you, the, 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 the steel, bowl hits the floor and the dog comes running for the food. So you've got a group of equity investors in the United States that think, okay, the Fed's going to pivot in a softer landing, 18 times earnings is okay for the S&P because the Fed's going to pivot the whole thing. Because that's what's worked the last 15 years. Every time the Fed's there for you. But the problem is inflation 6%. So if the, Fed, if, if the Fed's pivoting right now, Walmart, like, and my point is a soft landing is probably the worst thing that can possibly happen because Walmart, uh, their minimum wage in 2019-20 was $11. Now it's $14.15, you know, which is a good thing for middle-class families. You want higher wages, right? But the problem is higher wages across the equity market with higher interest costs crush profit margins absolutely crushed profit margin. So you've got companies that were financing themselves at one, 2% interest that over the next couple of years, uh, because of this elevated global inflation, uh, are going to be refinancing at three, three, four, 8% interest. So the bottom line is if in, in, a, in an inflationary regime, value stocks, commodities, harder assets do great. And the only way to, for the Fed to really kill inflation is extreme unemployment. And so anything the Fed does to soften the path and kind of get us through is, uh, is just re very quickly re-accelerates inflation. Look at, look at what just happened. On October 21st, right in front of the midterm elections, they softened the path with leaks to the Wall Street Journal. And it was so, so strategically placed, right? And, and, that, and that's been the low. That's been the low at this point. The low. And it was leaked to the Wall Street Journal that they were going to change the path. So it wasn't like a 2018, 19 pivot that you talked about earlier and where they went from cut, they went from hiking rates to cutting, but it was pretty significant significant because when you go from hiking rates at 140 miles an hour to hiking rates at 30 miles an hour, that's a big pivot. Like people sure. don't really understand it, but that's a huge pivot. And so that's what happened. They were hiking at 140. They said, okay, we're going to take it down to 30 miles an hour in terms of hikes. And we've had this bounce in gas prices are up 30% in 30 days. Popper names are up 40% off the lows. You've got crypto coins that no one's heard of that have $7 billion valuations. This is like August all over. So if your pal sitting having morning coffee, the chairman of the Federal Reserve with say someone like uh, Neil Kashkari, you're talking about what just happened, all these risk assets, all this inflation creeping back in, and you've You've thrown 450 basis points of rate hikes. You're, you're just so frustrated because now they probably have to rug pull it again. Remember Jackson Hole, they rug pulled this. They, they were kind of like leaking a softer, potentially softer path. And then they came in with this hawkish reversal and Powell ripped up their speech at Jackson Hole. I suspect that's what they're going to have to do now to kind of calm down this inflation revival. Understood. I wouldn't be surprised as well. Going, going back to... 2008, 2007, 2008. I remember, so I had a baby in 07. So this is probably spring of 08 uh, when Bear Stearns really went down. I think David Einhorn was on CNBC with Maria and she was asking him, why are you shorting Lehman and what's your real problem? And I think it was Bear and Lehman that he was talking about. I can't remember, but I remember playing on the kid. It was like my day off. I'm playing on the carpet with my baby and just keeping an ear open. And Einhorn's like, these guys are all full of, you know what, uh, can't trust the executives, nothing makes sense. I don't like it. I think it's a zero kind of a deal. And, you know, everyone's like, what the hell? No one else is talking like this, right? Except for maybe your guys on the floor. No one else is talking like that. What's your view of his role in, and I know that you got, I know that maybe you have a relationship, but what, Tell me more about Einhorn and what his analysis was at that time. 
Well, I mean, this guy is, you know, I think he's the potential Buffett of this era. Like if, if we if we go into a real value regime, which I think these growth to value things, they go in long cycles. Like so the growth cycle lasted 10 plus years and it was great for, for growth stocks and fangs. Now Einhorn's up last year, I think 36%. I think that's net of fees. So this guy is just coming into an incredible period for, for his company. And we've been recommending David and other people in the value space for last year to advisors because of this trend shift into the value. But you know, he has a group of indicators. He has an incredible team and he he's, he's a tough leader. He, he demands uh, the best of dedication and, and he really kind of really helps his team understand risk. Uh, he, he looks at macro risk. They look, they don't look 10,000 feet down. They look 20, 30,000 feet down into companies. And so what he was looking at is like, okay, Lehman was funding itself in the short-term repo market, but they had all these, it was like what they called a funding mismatch. And he, pick, he picked up on this before everybody. So you're funding yourself in the short-term market, which was very deep back then. The short-term repo market, that's all that means is like short-term financing between banks and you get short-term loans for nothing. And you can, but, but you could hold, it's, you know, $700 billion of a liquid asset. So as long as you could fund these things, you could easily just, Hold on to your, 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 so you're long the illiquid and you're, you're potentially, you, but you have to fund that through this like vehicle on the front end of the curve. And the Fed had hiked rates and the recession was coming. We were having all these mortgage resets. So, you know, he saw that way before everybody else. And that's why he's David Ihorn. Uh, and, and he made a great call. He was short Lehman. But now, and he had the balls to go on TV and be the only one to say it. Yeah, all they want to say it with conviction. He did it at the Iris Own conference. He did it every. I was I was saying in the book. He, he yelled from the top of the you know yeah. from the top of Times Square with the with the, with the speakerphone. I mean, you couldn't have, you couldn't have done it any any other. I mean, you couldn't have been more uh, outrageously. Uh, and, and and you know you know people like Dick Fold and all the other executives uh, uh, at Bayer and you know Merrill, they all come on CNBC and they say the same things. Everything's fine. You know, we're buying stock. Everything's great. And you, you just can't believe them, you know? And, and I remember I was kind of a kid, right? Graduating from college in 2000, watching CNBC, buying Cisco, right? These are not recommendations, full disclosure. This is for educational purposes only. So I'm watching CNBC in, two, in March of 2000 or something like this. And JDS Uniface starts going down and they have the CEO on and he's like, everything's great. Sales are going up. And it's like total lot, just complete lies, right? Yeah. Like cheerleading. Yeah, what we call it is obfuscation. So, you know, the, there's all these companies that want, you know, they got to pay bonuses in stock. A lot of companies these days have, have um, the, the way they compensate their, their top employees is with stock. So they really need to move and keep that stock higher or they're going to lose some talent. And so... One of the things that people like Einhorn, we've got a number of guys in the chat. They, they, some guys in the chat have what, what's called a footnote indicator. And so if you look at SEC filings um, and all of a sudden there's like over the next, over two, three quarters, if there's an acceleration in, in a number of footnotes that are in the balance sheet, that means that th there's something going on there in the balance sheet where they're footnoting, like they're making, they're making statements up here and then they're footnoting like little deep, it's obfuscation, and it's uh, you can see that in some in a lot in, in a lot of companies out there that are like, especially with this debt situation. Before I can't emphasize this enough, you know, Carl Icahn talks about this, but as a credit person, as a person that looks at bonds, um, the the S and P for the last ten years has been supported by very cheap capital and very low interest rates, so companies could borrow at one two percent and then buy back stock. You know, now that's that's going to be like said before. That's going up to like borrowing at five, six, seven, ten percent, and it changes the whole ratio. Of all of a sudden, buying back stock is very expensive, and the whole gamesmanship around. That's why you have these cycles where, for a long time, S and P will the S and P will trade in the United States right now, like eighteen to twenty-one times earnings the last like three, four years. Meanwhile, Brazil banks and and, and companies in other parts of the world that have higher interest rate regimes. Are trading at eight, nine, ten times earnings. 
And like, so you have countries like Brazil that have been dealing with inflation for 10 years, been dealing with very high bond yields, 10 to 13% for 10 years. So what happens is the, the ecosystem of some of these EM countries becomes very value centric and the ecosystem of the US becomes very growth centric. And so there are these shifts going on now where all these investors still think that we're in this growth regime, but we're moving toward a value regime and other parts of the world where the stocks are trading at eight to 10 times earnings, uh, that's where the best risk reward is because those countries and those consumers have already dealt with inflation and high bond yields. I want to keep going, coming back to the book because there's so many good things I want to ask you about, Larry. The, the, the trip to, to California to hang out with the bodybuilders with some <laughs> beers at lunch, I got I to gotta hear, you know, some one of these hidden gems here for our for our audience. Well, I'm really proud. Another thing I'm proud of is the movie The Big Big Short. Right? They uh, one of their producers called me. I won't mention any names. They said we're gonna take a scene out of your book. You know, probably you're probably not gonna get compensated, but <laughs> we loved your book. And uh, and so there's some movies out there like Margin Call and The Big Short. That, that took some things out of our book and they, that are incredibly entertaining. They, they made it so entertaining. But yeah, there's a scene in the big short with these two these two guys just sitting there at the bar and like in, in like, I think it was, I think it was Los Angeles or San Diego. And, and they're just like, they're mortgage brokers and they're, they're one of them's a bodybuilder and they were making like six, 700 grand a year because of those mortgage resets. And we're sitting there and I'm, I'm out there with some really talented, distressed and high yield analysts and we're asking them basic questions about their understanding of the mortgage products that they've been selling. <laughs> these, guys, these guys have no idea what, like the, the repercussions of what they saw. So these two people had sold, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of these products. And there's these products were like toxic. And now you're seeing the same thing in the United Kingdom where, and in other parts of the world where you got this big move up in rates and, the housing market is so exposed to these, you know, the uh, reset. And to some extent, Canada is in this situation. But the good thing about Canada is um, they have about 30 to 40 percent of the market resets over like two to three years. So it's not like with the more in these mortgage resets, they would kick in sometimes pretty quick. Like in the, like so, they would all kick the reset. So in other words, basically you're getting a mortgage at like one percent, but then it can like as a teaser rate. And then it can go up to like six, 7% uh, in, in 12 months or 18 months or three years. Um, and other parts of the world, what's fascinating about what you're talking about is that this problem in Australia and Canada and to some extent the UK is like they didn't learn that lesson. And whereas in the United States, because we were punched in the face with the financial crisis and we were the epicenter, if you look at the United States uh, and people say this to me all on Twitter, and they're right. Um, maybe I want to guess like 65, 70 percent of the of the mortgage market has been farmed out. It's a longer term paper. So U.S. consumers on the mortgage side get the joke. They locked in uh, these rates, but in the rest of the world, the 30 year mortgage pretty much doesn't exist. So we have some very in this higher interest rate regime. We have some very inter entertaining things that are about to happen. Going back to 2008 as well. You know, I read I read the Bernanke book and uh, the Paulson book, and who was the who was Obama's secretary treasurer, uh, secretary of the treasury in his first couple of years? Who was the New York Fed governor? Can't remember his name at the moment. Uh, he Geithner? had the book. Yeah, Geithner had the it's book. Geithner. Okay. And you know, everyone has their and George Bush had his autobiography. You know, and like when you read the books, all the explanations make sense, right? But what I still keep coming back to is like Lehman versus AIG, right? Like they made the choice to save AIG and they let Lehman go down. Like, what do you think about that? Well, you know, there's, a, there's just, we needed, the US was heading toward a horrific depression and they needed to pass the trouble asset relief program uh, to inject all this cash into the banks and save the system. Because in the depression, Bernanke had learned from the depression that there was no like, like one of the things about the, the old days, right? That was 
true capitalism, right? Like, like a true capitalism can be very dangerous, like in, a, in its full laissez-faire self, because it, you have booms and the busts in the, in the history of capitalism in the early stages were much more extreme, uh, which make things much more painful. And that's why we have the Great Depression. Um, whereas, you know, these guys in Washington by, the, by 2008, had learned that they really need to create a mechanism to protect the system from depression. And that mechanism included this troubled asset relief program, which had 50 billion for each bank, for the big ones, 50 billion. Back then, that was a lot of money in 2008. And so by letting Lehman fail, Lehman was small enough that they could hold on to their laissez-faire free market capital. It was like we were having what's called a moral hazard moment where they bailed out countrywide. They basically forced countrywide into the arms of, I think, Bank of America. They bailed out, uh, I think, Washington Mutual, the, mm -hmm. another merger. I and think so that was JP. Yeah, JP Morgan. They're, so they're basically creating these marriages that fall, like gun to the head, you know, they can shotgun marriage. And then they then they bailed out Bear Stearns and with, with the JP Morgan thing again, twice. Yeah. Jamie. And so it got to the point where people were pretty pissed off uh, about the way capitalism was, was, was functioning. And so it was like a moral hazard moment. So it's a group of politicians that, that really wanted somebody to fail. And, uh, and they, they didn't understand. So Mike Gelban, one of the things that there's a scene in the book where Mike is uh, in at the Fed building and he's talking to these guys and they, they wanted to get a call into President Bush and you know, Mike said, "You will. You got to be very careful. If you let Lehman down, you're going to unleash the forces of dark evil on the global financial markets." So it's going to be much. I mean, this is going to be like a meteor hitting the planet and, and having a financial repercussions that are hundreds of thousands of miles away. And um, but they, you know, they they needed to let Lehman fail. To so by letting Lehman fail, that actually got Nancy Pelosi and everybody behind the tarp, and they passed it. And that was the, the, sh the shock absorber between that and the Fed that got us into that, you know, pretty incredible, you know, 50% drawdown. And then by 2011, 12, I, you know, three or four years later, where stocks were not at the highs, but they were way off the lows. So, Larry, you know, from my seat uh, as retail registered investment advisor, you know, financial planning, CFP, like we really look at the planning. And the, the investments are very important. Uh, they're the vehicle that drives the financial plan. That's kind of how we talk uh, and how we how we feel. And you know, it's there's a lot of uncertainty going forward with inflation and the Fed. And is there going to be a recession this year? And the growth versus value and the U.S. versus international. I mean, what kind of parallels can we pull out of uh, the 2008 experience? Or are there no parallels? You know, what what do you think? we're thinking about in the future and what are you advising some of your people to do? Well, in, in our next book, we talk about, so Lehman, you had a, a sovereign bailout of the bank. So that means a government bail, that word sovereign is just a government bailout of the banks. And then with COVID, you had a sovereign bailout of horrific destructive lockdowns, right? So you lock down the country for 12 to 18 months, whatever it was globally in each country. And you bailed that out with debt. Um, and then now you have horrific energy prices in Europe and the United States. And essentially, they're, that's one thing. The so, it's another the sovereign governments are bailing out, especially in Europe, uh, energy crisis. And that's actually keeping, ironically, that's going to keep energy prices pretty high because we've had this situation where You've got you've got a world where you know you got 1.4 billion people that are in India with no air conditioning, and 1.4 billion people in China with no automobile, and then you have this ESG backdrop the last like four or five years, three years especially, or in the world of the United States around the suppression of investment, and if you're if you're an investor, a long-term investor in oil and gas, you've got, you've had, and you just watched the debates, the last presidential debates in the last election, 
there's no there's no sane person in the world that would, would make long term investments in that environment. So the Davos crowd, and this is real what I call pot smoking, crack smoking group of people in terms of unintended consequences. The Davos crowd is all behind globalization, which is great. God bless them. They've taken 500,000 jobs out of the United States, high paying jobs, and they've shotgunned them around the world. God, but you know what? They've done a bad, bad thing for the US, which has had a tremendous political impact in, in the last two election cycles. But the good thing is they raised the standard of living dramatically in Bangladesh in India, in China. Uh, but oh, by the way, breaking news, if you have 1 billion people in India that don't have air conditioning and you raise the standard of living at the fastest pace, probably, probably of all time, then what do you do? You're creating a massive explosion of new energy consumers. So 1.4 billion people, if 200, billion, 200 million of those uh, young kids, uh, yeah, you're a little younger than you, but you're, you look young, but, but say someone between like 25 and 35, that, that those all of a sudden that guy's working in a call center or a manufacturing company, all of a sudden he's making 20 times what his great grandfather made, right? And he wants to build a family and wants to play with his kids in, in, a, in an air conditioned environment. Diesel consumption, um, oil consumption, coal consumption, diesel consumption, which are the mopeds, right? So he's got a lot of, a lot of these younger people didn't have an automobile, but they have a moped now. Uh, those things get, those hogs get 75 miles per gallon though, right? Yeah, 75, I mean, this <laughs> diesel consumption in India is up 12% year over year, 12 to 14, but it's it's above 2019 levels pre-COVID. So like you're, you're talking about like a country that was dramatically hit with COVID and now they're just, they've just ran back. But because once again, you've taken, these jobs out of the United States, you've decimated the Rust Belt, right? You've, you've improved the standard of living globally, but, but, but the same backdrop, you've had this ESG uh, dynamic, which is suppressing. So you're basically financing demand, right? And you're suppressing supply. And so we, yes. are, on the, we are on the cusp of one of the greatest miscalculations. And you see in Germany, you see, this is, I mean, they have made such a colossal miscalculation on the green agenda, which is fine. They spent $600 billion and they're still addicted. I mean, $600 billion in, 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 um, in, in, in wind and solar and, and renewables, right? Which is wonderful. But there's still 40% were exposed after all that investment, 40% exposed to, to Vladimir Putin. So you take that mistake and you just think about it. these are the smartest, some of the smartest engineers on the planet. They made that kind of a miscalculation. That is happening on a grand scale across the planet. We are, this energy crisis is going to be something that changes all of our lives forever because we just don't have the investments and the rest of the planet is, is, is uh, you've improved the standard of living so fast and they can't possibly, like the bottom line is carbon neutral 2030 or 2050 is the biggest pile of BS. It's really carbon neutral 2090 because 2090. These are countries are not rich. You can't just turn 1.4 billion people into like, uh, you know, solar, you know, solar wind and solar uh, consumers. And it, it's going to take a long time. And so the bottom line is where to invest your uranium and nuclear power, your copper, your oil and gas. These are bull markets that are going to last a long time because that, that, Oil and gas is, and, and uranium is going to fill that gap. We will get to carbon neutral 2080, 2090, but it's 2080, 2090. We will get there. We're going to a green metal. That's a good thing. But the timeline from the Davos crowd is complete and utter uh, Pollyannish fantasy. So uh, like a balanced portfolio, traditionally 60, 40, right? You know, if we go back a year, that 40 was yielding next to nothing. It looks much better today, right? If you're 60, 40, from my opinion. But you might make the case that you want to be more value tilted or towards energy. What's energy? 5% of the S&P. Well, maybe it should be 15 or 20%, something like that. But the 60, 40, you know, we've been having conversations with a lot of people, 60, 20, 20, especially a year ago, because, uh, you know, with 40% yielding so low, you can peel some money off and own some private credit and some private equity and some commodity-based themes and stuff like that, real estate. 
where they have low correlations, they still have nice potential. Um, you might disagree on private equity, uh, but uh, you know that's into part of that energy theme with commodities, right? Yeah, so let me give an example. From 1968 to 1981, the S&P was essentially flat, and that was a pretty serious inflationary regime. 68 to 81. By 1981, 40%, I'm sorry, 49%. So by 1981, 49% of the Dow Jones Industrial Average or the S&P, you can look at both of them, was energy, materials, and industrials. 49% energy, materials, and industrials. You came into to 2022 with this number, like with, back then it was 2% maybe for oil and gas in the beginning of 22, maybe two, three. It was two or 3%, 3% for materials and maybe it might've been six, six seven, eight. You're talking about like 12, 11, 12, 11, 11, 12% of the, of the indice was materials, energy, and industrials. So we are going back to a period where, this is where you talked about your asset allocation. This is where people need advisors right now. You, the days of just owning, you know, indice, indexes is like over. Um, and so you're going to have a, we don't go back, we don't go back to 49, but do we get back to, do we get to 30, 35? Oh, yes, we do. Because in an, in an inflationary regime or in this type of regime or higher yield regime, you need to be long value, you need to be long dust, like totally different for Dan Loeb said it best. I get the best compliment because you and I were talking about this in the bear trap support like a year and a half ago. This was our thesis. Dan Loeb said the other day, and this is one of the best hedge fund managers in the world, billionaire, because everybody's looking at the previous decades, darlings, and they're just, you know, they're hoping that they come back to their old self. And because you'll get a rally or two, but that's just not happening. We're into a value industrials global equity regime. Wow, Larry, Larry called it here with energy and materials and value. Mm -hmm. You know, Larry, much gratitude for all the work that you've done. I'm happy to be a partner with Bear Traps over the last decade and hopefully for the next decade. Much gratitude for the time spent here. In closing, uh, I want to incentivize people to listen all the way through. If you've made it to this point, send me an email, nick at peakwm.com. Get a copy of Colossal. Colossal, Colossal Failure of Common Sense. <laughs> Colossal Failure of Common Sense, the inside story of the collapse of Lehman Brothers with Larry McDonald. But last question for you. Uh, what's next for you? Do you see the bear traps, the chat, the new book as your next project for the indefinite? or you know, what's, you're going to spend more time with the kids. What are you going to do? Well, yeah, I've got, it's great. Um, like you, I'm a, I'm a dad. I've got a seven-year-old, nine-year-old. I'm enjoying a lot of time with the kids. Um, I never want to be uh, kind of exposed to a bank again. Like I want to, uh, that's the best part of the Bear Trap support is working with people like you and working with hedge fund managers and pension funds. And you can do that remotely on these calls. You can, I can do my trips but, uh, you know, we're going to build the business. The, the new book will be out. We're going to do a, I want to take, take my brand. So we've done probably maybe a thousand appearances on CNBC and Fox and Bloomberg. So we have a very like financial industrial type brand. You know, I think I want to reach back, reach out to some younger people through uh, other channels. You're, you're actually my inspiration that you've done a great job on, on YouTube and great job on Instagram. And uh, we, you know, we, on Twitter, we have like hundred, hundred, thousand followers and on Instagram we have none so I need to reinvent myself so that that's kind of my goal for the next couple of years gotcha well I'll I'll enjoy watching from from my seat thank you so much Larry and much much gratitude for the time today and Thanks, for all Dick. the good tips and trades along the way thank you sir all the best bro